And next up is Dimitri Pizarev's talk about best React best practices. Uh, as you know, uh, Dimitri has given quite a few talks uh, in the past uh, about his experience of getting into React. And uh, Dimitri is really active on Twitter. Uh, if you you know are into React as well. I do follow him, and uh, you know I see him talking on Twitter with different people uh, from you know the React community and the core team, and asking them about their ideas about certain integrations or how they would solve certain uh, problems. So I'm really excited uh, how he's really taking us on this journey with him uh, through the last Neos conferences. So. Um, I hope we have him uh, to ask some questions this year again. Yes, okay, I'm getting a thumbs up there. Um, I really enjoyed that last year. So without much further ado, uh, the next talk is React Best Practices, The Great Shift You Might Have Missed in the Recent Years by Dimitri Pizarev. Enjoy. online. Really sad that I couldn't make it uh, to be in Dresden this year due to COVID travel restrictions. Uh, I'm really sad about it. <laughs> so hope to see you all uh, next year for sure. Hope like this whole COVID madness will be over by then. So allow me to introduce myself. Uh, my name is Dmitry Pisarev. I work in St. Phil's Christian Institute and I'm a Christian believer myself. Also, I'm a Neos Minions team member since a few years already. Don't remember, don't even remember how long actually. Um, and also, I'm a part-time uh, contractor at uh, a charity startup called Deed. And uh, also, I'm a father of two girls and one son. I like running and just being outside most of the time. Right, so a few words about today's talk. Like I was supposed to deliver a talk about React best practices and all the things we have learned building Reacts, uh, React applications last few years, but I would have to focus on one specific topic today uh, because it just took all, all the time of this talk. So this topic that stole all the attention today is, you were right, you guessed it, it's state management. So why is that such a big topic? Well, here you see like all the uh, state management libraries uh, that are there in React, and I had to try out a good part of them actually just to to see, uh, just to make sure I'm not missing anything important. Um, and uh, yeah, that has severely affected my mental health lately. I have been losing sleep. I've been seeing nightmares about being trapped in a state manager, manager or in a saga or whatever. Um, so hopefully it would go away after I finish recording this talk. So anyways, bear with me. And um, the reason why we have had such innovation of state management uh, solutions is because when React was presented back in 2013, it didn't provide, like, uh, it didn't give you an opinionated solution on how to manage your state. All it gave you is a set state uh, method. Uh, and they were free to experiment how you would spread the state, how you would uh, coordinate state updates, etc., etc. And that's both like a bad thing and a good thing because we've seen like amazing innovation uh, happening in the last few years and still happening actually. Um, and that wouldn't have been possible if we would have would have had an opinionated solution right off the box. Um, 
So before we move on, uh, let's define what we uh, understand by a state management solution, what it should provide us with. Because like when preparing for this talk, I've heard a lot of opinions on that. So for this talk, I take like the simplest approach to this. And a state management solution should allow us to store an initial value, to read from that value, and to update a value. And you'd probably say that we already have such state management solution right inside React. It's called useState. Uh, it allows us to uh, do all, all the three things quite elegantly, I would say. So why would we need anything else besides that? So here is the first problem. Uh, back in the days, uh, the only way, like the only official way for you to spread the uh, state throughout your app uh, was via props drilling, which means just passing state uh, down through props. And uh, while it had some benefits of being explicit and you could like uh, immediately see where something is coming from and where it's being used, etc. Uh, it was rather hard to work with on a larger scale. So quickly some solutions started to appear. And now we have a context API, a stable version of context API, which has replaced the legacy context API, which had its own set of problems. So uh, what allow, it allows us to do is to put the state again, like somewhere at the top level of your app uh, where um, like uh, it's going to be used by all these children. And then we put the state into a context provider. And then any kind of any component that's a child of this provider, um, no matter how deeply nested it is, uh, it should be able to consume this context with use context hook. So it looks quite elegant and simple. And actually, for a lot of things, it should be enough just to use these two, like use use context uh, use context uh, together with use state or use um, reducer, and you should be good to go for simpler apps. However, we would have a problem in a bigger app, like for example, Neo's user interface. We uh, do have a rendering, we do have like representation of the same uh, information of same entities in different parts of the user interface uh, component trees. And so, for example, if we update uh, a value in one place, like for example in an inspector or through inline editing, it should spread, it should be like synchronized with all other places where you see that information in an app. So with uh, use context with context API, we could have put like the whole node tree into context and subscribe from each of these nodes to it, um, and uh, that would work. But once we um, update um, anything within that uh, state, it would re-render not only the children not only the nodes which were supposed to be updated, which were edited, but also all other nodes which subscribe to the same context. So context has a very cool um, optimization feature that it allows you to work, um, allows you uh, that all uh, context subscribers would be, would get updated whenever context changes, even if there are some components higher in component tree that uh, implement, uh, for example, should component update that uh, bail out out of uh, updates. But uh, deeply nested component would re-render anyways if it subscribes to context. And that's actually quite cool because like the legacy context API 
wasn't able to do that, and there would have been problems when, uh, where updates to your app could have been swallowed by some components uh, which have uh, implemented should component update, like not in the right way, uh, forgetting to check for state values, uh, uh, context values. Um, um, so yeah, uh, how, how do we solve this problem? And there is actually an ancient solution you probably all thought about right away. It's called Redux. And um, here is an example. Like first, just let me answer a few a few of your concerns um, about Redux. So the biggest complaint I've heard about Redux is uh, that it's very boilerplatey. So you need to write a lot of boilerplate code, and that's actually no longer the case with um, Redux Toolkit. Um, so here you see an example of the same code, um, and like if you compare it with the context API code, there's just not not much more code. Um, you see a helper function create slice, uh, which creates for us a store and a reducer and actions. No, it doesn't create store. It creates for us reducer and actions in an opinionated way, uh, the way that's suggested by Redux maintainers. maintainers. Um, and um, I don't know how you feel about this, but I'm quite okay with writing such code, and I don't think that this amount of boilerplate is currently a big problem. But uh, you might still say, like, doesn't Redux use context itself? Like, we do have to wrap our whole uh, app in a Redux provider, right? Well, actually, uh, Redux uses context API only to pass down the store uh, and not state itself. The state lives outside of your component tree. And um, basically, here is a very naive implementation um, where you see we get a store from context and we subscribe to store updates. And then uh, we have a way to force re-render the component that has subscribed to the state. Um, like force re-render is just basically set state uh, with some arbitrary value which causes component to re-render. But we only do it when uh, the value that this particular uh, component has subscribed to has changed. So here is what uh, Sebastian Macbeth I hope I'm pronouncing his name right. I had to say that uh, that Redux context is good for low frequency updates like local theme. Uh, and um, so it wouldn't do for uh, general state management. Actually, if you're curious about this topic more, uh, you can read about um, how uh, Redux was rewritten in version 6 uh, to be using context to spread uh, state and how it failed uh, with performance issues when trying to do that. And in version 7, it was rewritten back uh, to, you, to having state outside of uh, React. Um, and um, that, yeah, that's... That's a very interesting and tricky problem to solve. So Recoil is another library from Facebook, uh, which was presented last summer, uh, which is trying to give a stab, uh, trying to solve uh, a problem, the same problem of performance, uh, when multiple uh, trees, uh, component trees, are tracking the same value. Um, and the problem, the performance problem we have with Redux is that the more uh, the more nodes you have in your app, the harder it be becomes to track this um, like equality equality check. So we still we don't re-render all the components, but we the complexity of checking which 
components should be re-rendered, re which shouldn't, it incre increases in a linear, linear uh, way. And uh, recoil solves it like in a quite interesting manner. Um, you can think of it as wrapping each node in your app tree uh, in a separate context. So uh, whenever um, a context, like whenever context value changes, like just those uh, places, in, like with this particular specific node uh, in your app, they would be updated. And it doesn't need to care about any other nodes. So from ON complexity, it changes to be O1 uh, complexity. And um, also, it's even less boilerplate than uh, Redux Toolkit. And it provides a very familiar API, uh, quite similar to useState. So here is an example of the same code rewritten with, um, uh, with recoil. So basically, we uh, take uh, our usual use state uh, hook and replace it with use recoil state. We point it to a particular state atom, uh, which has its own ID and a default value. And then anywhere in the app, we can um, so, like subscribe to it and um, get the same uh, state set state tuple that we are used to from use state. So actually, I've um, written already uh, I think three apps with recoil, and uh, the thing I especially liked it is about how quick it is to get used to and uh, learn. The problem with it, however, like not the problem, but um, if you compare recoil to Redux, you lose the semantics of actions. So Redux gives you a log of all actions that were happening in the app. And recoil allows you to track updates globally, but you don't have semantic, uh, semantically described actions uh, which were reasons to those updates. Uh, so that's a bit unfortunate. Uh, but uh, in a lot of cases, um, there's just no need to do that, no need to track state updates so explicitly. So if you are ready to throw um, that aspect of uh, Redux away, um, you cut on a lot of boilerplate, and that's just really nice and easy to use. And there is even simpler and more lightweight library library called Yotai. I probably mispronounced it. Sorry, I forgot to look up how it's supposed to be pronounced. But anyways, it's basically a clone of Recoil uh, implementing a subset of its functionality. Uh, so even for simpler projects, uh, it has like um, smaller API service, even smaller API service to learn and uh, also does the job quite nicely. So, so yeah, I, I would recommend using this Yotai for cases when uh, you just have a simple app and you don't want to bother with uh, context uh, API to spread the state around. So this is actually, like I think, quite... Uh, quite lean way to describe uh, what you want. There's another one called Zustand. Uh, did I mispronounce it as well? <laughs> yeah, okay, write to me if that was the right way to say it. Anyways, um, so the way it's different from Yotai and Recoil is that um, it doesn't need a context provider. Uh, which, uh, uh, like, basically your store lives completely outside of React land, and that allows you to uh, let your React app communicate and share state with some other non-React code. 
So if you are doing micro front ends and you need some simple solution to coordinate state, uh, that's a pretty, pretty cool way to go about it. Um, so we have discussed state management, but like when we talk about state management, which is just basically tracking updates to state, um, there is another topic which is closely related to it. Uh, like uh, if your state updates are caused by uh, some effects, like uh, some asynchronous operations which are touching the parts uh, of the system which are outside of your front of the app, um, then you also need a way to coordinate what's going on. So uh, we already have an effect management system built in, into React, and you all know it. It's called use effect, uh, use effect hook. So here, for example, we are uh, fetching a list of blog posts and showing a loading indicator while it's loading, an error message if it failed, uh, and a list of blog posts when it's done. And that works nice, but uh, that's kind of like a very imperative way to think about effects. Okay, so let's look into how we could have solved the same problem with Redux. Um, like first of all, we have used a Redux toolkit again to define our uh, reducers and actions and default state. And here it's defined way more declaratively, like we no longer set each state piece uh, one at a time, but rather we have actions uh, which um, describe all the legal state uh, transitions. And uh, also Redux uh, Toolkit supports out of the box uh, a Redux Thunk, uh, which allows you to dispatch a, a uh, to make a sync uh, operations and return promises from within your action creators. So here we first dispatch a fetch started action, then we do the actual fetch, and we do fetch complete on completion. Um, and then dis display uh, the information which we got this way. Um, and uh, like this piece of code is not really declarative as well. It's like basically a function, an asynchronous function which can do uh, uh, whatever you want. And um, like it has maximum freedom and freedom is rarely a good thing in software development. So you may look into one of like many, many solutions for managing effects with Redux, be it Redux Saga or Redux Observable or many, many others. I have like worked extensively with these two. Actually, Redux Saga is used in Neos UI um, and it served us a good job there. Now, you might be wondering how Recoil goes about solving the same problem. And um, actually, it supports uh, um, uh, returning promises, like having doing async, async, asynchronous uh, selectors. Um, and um, the way the loading state is handled here and the error state is handled is uh, different. Uh, it uh, uses uh, the experimental uh, React uh, Suspense API, which only works in concurrent mode, uh, which is not available in the production versions of React, but you may still use it anyways, because Facebook does. At least you can try. Um, so uh, how, how this works is that when this, uh, while this promise hasn't resolved, the app suspends and shows a loading indicator instead. And once the promise has resolved, it just continues to learn uh, to render posts list component uh, with all posts being there already. So you've already heard me mentioning Redux Observable, which under the hood uses RxJS. But um, in case you like RxJS and um, you don't have to 
use uh, Redux with it. You can use, uh, you can just basically subscribe to your observables directly um, in React. You can do it like uh, do it in use effects, and you sub would subscribe to your observable and uh, set state on new values coming from it. Or you can use a very cool library like observable hooks, and there are many, many other similar kind of libraries which do similar things. So yeah, you might argue that this code is really hard to get and uh, hard to wrap your mind around, uh, but basically it works like math. That <laughs> to an, an initiated person it looks really intimidating, but once you get into it and spend some time learning it, uh, it helps you to uh, operate like um, with events in a using like a very powerful and uh, concise mechanism that it provides. And the good thing is that it's used, like it's quite popular and it's used in Angular and um, basically in a lot of other places. So I would say it's a good investment to use RxJS in case you would need to do some complex transformations uh, with events. But uh, the downside of it uh, is that if you have like a lot of junior developers on your team or a lot of contractors, uh, they might just start uh, writing code by copy pasting some things from somewhere without clearly understanding what's going on. And I've witnessed myself like on some projects where that leads to some subtle bugs where people have written RxJS code without fully understanding what's happening and never never taking the time to learn it properly um so yeah that's like the thing with all uh the high level abstractions uh if you if you don't invest time into learning them they would give you more harm they would bring more harm uh, than good so uh proceed with caution i would say Say. And another high-level abstraction that could help us to make our business logic uh, logic more uh, predictable and clear is XState. It's a state management uh, library based on finite state machines. So it has this uh, declarative format to provide to define legal states your app might have and uh, also legal transitions between these states. So here, for example, you can see that um, once uh, we are in an idle state, we start with an idle state and uh, we uh, get a fetch uh, transition initiated which takes us to loading state and inside loading state we invoke an asynchronous action uh, which uh, when resolved like it transitions us to a success state on done and uh, gets the event data uh, sets the uh, context to event data and on error it sets uh, errors um, that we got uh, and uh, from a success state you can't go anywhere and from failure state you might retry and they have a very nice built-in uh, state uh, machine visualizer where you can see just this things happening so we start from idle transition to loading then we either go to success or to failure and from, from failure we might retry um, and one more uh, library I've uh, discovered, which is really hyped in Russian React community, uh, it's called Factor.js, Factor. Uh, but um, I guess people outside of Russia haven't really heard about it much. So, um, like, uh, I'm not entirely sold on it myself, but I'm getting into it. Um, so uh, it's a like it, it it also tries to combine a state management and effect management into one uh, box basically. Um, so you have uh, actions, stores, 
and effects and uh, you have way to uh, you have some powerful operators to map uh, to connect uh, in various combinations these three things together so uh, I mean it took me quite some time to get it but yeah I'm kind of slow maybe you'll have more luck um, but uh, so here's what's basically going on we define a, an effect which is basically a an asynchronous function which may resolve into three states of either fail or done so yeah it has like a pending state and it may it will emit uh, an event of done or fail and then we can create a store subscribing to this uh, done and fail events and uh, then we can use this store to just render the UI. Um, so it's definitely something to to try to experiment if your app has like a complex uh, logic, complex business logic that you want to define outside of your app, uh, outside of uh, I mean outside of your UI layer. You want to extract extract the uh, business logic from the view layer, uh, then that's a good thing uh, to try. Um, I mean, I personally would say that uh, I didn't have so many projects where it would be justified to use something as advanced, because I believe that each tool should be used for to match the complexity of the task that you are facing. So if you just bring the fanciest tools like Effector.js or RxJS to simple problems, to teams where there are like a lot of junior developers, or um, I, I guess people would just struggle with it and misuse it. Um, but that, that's just my feeling. Uh, I'm curious what you guys think uh, about like when it's justified to use which solution, but I generally prefer to take the simplest solution possible um, and then just move on from there and uh, refactor when you see something uh, difficult uh, to describe. Uh, like when you see the situation getting out of hand, just refactor and find a better tool. So um, I would definitely be exploring Effector.js more myself and uh, hopefully I would get some cool project uh, where it would be uh, justified to try it. Um, but uh, give it a try yourself and share your feedback, share your findings. I would really be curious to know um, what you think about it. Uh, I spoke, uh, yesterday I spoke with the creators of Effector.js Factor JS, and they were really nice to share to explain some things which I couldn't uh, get myself. <laughs> So we've already looked uh, into quite a number of ways to manage state and manage effects in your app. But there is also one thing to keep in mind that our app actually have different kinds of state and uh, different kinds of state uh, deserve different kinds of treatment. So let's think what we have in our app. Like, first of all, we have some uh, local component state, like, for example, uh, opening uh, or closing a model. Uh, then we have uh, a cache of our server side state. So basically, that's like a list of posts that we have shown in the previous examples. Uh, or uh, like uh, we might uh, mutate server state uh, while uh, like uh, mutating requests. And uh, then we would need to update the cache and um, also the, the server side uh, side cache of our data might get out of date if somebody else edits the same data uh, besides us, then we would need to refetch uh, the data from the server side uh, to update the cache that we have. 
Um, then we have a global app state, um, which is like a theme or like anything that basically all of our components should be aware of, like the language, uh, etc., the, the logged in state and whatnot. Uh, then we have a routing state, uh, like the location which we are in in the app. And uh, finally, we have forms uh, and forms like also complex topic of their own, uh, which deserves special treatment. So uh, let's start with URL state. So I think like the uh, URL is a perfect um, state manager, like a state container. Um, so you can put a lot of things into it and that would uh, allow your UI to retain state on like reloads and it would be possible to share a link and uh, let a person see like exactly the same thing on their screens. Actually, I believe in um, URL as a state container so much that uh, in one of the recent apps that I've built, I've used xState to help me manage uh, URL transitions. So imagine we have an on on onboarding flow in our app. Uh, so here's just some small part of it, but it gets more and more complicated as we develop uh, the app. And uh, we can um, describe all the onboarding states in a state machine, uh, which uh, shows like all the legal state transitions between them. And if we want to resume uh, onboarding, we would know to which place inside the onboarding to go to exactly, uh, which is done via guards. Uh, it's another feature of fixed state. So uh, you can visualize all, all the onboarding steps uh, quite nicely, um, etc. And as the onboarding logic grows, uh, you'd only appreciate it more that you've invested into extracting it from inside uh, your view layer. And uh, here we use the uh, um, state, a state machine, but without actually putting state into it, but calling it uh, getting the state from a URL. So here is just like a quick and dirty example how uh, we see if the uh, we get the current onboarding state from a URL parameter, uh, basically, uh, and we call the uh, state machine providing the current step and the action that we want to take. And then we get uh, the value of the state machine in which we ended up. And if it's different from where we currently are, we just uh, initiate a router transition um, with that value. Uh, so it's like kind of trivial example how you can be creative and uh, use a state machine with an external state. Um, and in general, uh, instead of synchronizing states, it's better to just have a single source of truth for your state. So for example, if URL is the source of truth for your state, then there is no need to duplicate that state inside of your state management uh, machine. Um, another thing, uh, so let's talk a bit more about this server state versus client state problem. So, um, uh, so we already talked about server state being just a cache, uh, like the um, things which you get from the server and which you uh, keep uh, inside React state. Uh, they are way, way different in nature compared to other things which are client only. So they are basically only cached from the server. And uh, as you all know, caching is hard. You need to be able to invalidate caches to update them at the right time. Uh, when you do a mutation, you need to both like, for example, do optimistic updates and then um, uh, know how to roll back your state in case things go wrong server side, et cetera, et cetera. And um, this is a very complex topic. Uh, 
And uh, actually, if we look, for example, at uh, Neo's UI, uh, it was a source of complexity, uh, like of the, 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 the majority of things were, uh, and bongs as well, were about fetching the state from the server and um, updating it and keeping it in sync. And um, there's been like a number of tools, uh, like Apollo Client, if you're using GraphQL or React Query for, uh, for REST APIs, which solve a ton of problems with a very, very simple API. So um, here's like the same example rewritten with use query. So we just basically uh, fetch posts and then we let um, let uh, React query manage the loading status and the data uh, that we get out of it. So while it's loading, we just show a loading indicator and once the data is there, we just render it and that's all. So it's like basically as simple as it could be. But under the hood, it's doing a ton of things. So for example, it's doing like uh, automatic prefetching and uh, refetching if data get, gets out of you, out of hand. Uh, it supports server-side rendering, uh, render as you fetch uh, approach, and so on. Uh, it, it's just we just have no time to go into all the details. I could have a uh, dedicated talk on React Query, just how powerful it is. I've used it in a number of apps as well, and it just works, uh, works miracles. So um, that's a really cool thing that you can outsource a lot of most complicated work to uh, this dedicated libraries, which uh, like work kind of magically and do a lot of things on, for you under the hood. Um, and then all you have left with, like uh, all, all the all, all the state that is left is usually just simple enough for you to deal with yourself without using any complicated uh, state management solution, uh, just like with context and your state. Um, and that's a really, really good thing. Um, because such apps become much easier to maintain. So here's actually an example of what we were doing in Neos UI. So as I told you, we were using Redux and Redux Saga. And this is an example of what we do. Like this is just a very, very small fraction of code we uh, use to uh, synchronize um, node state. Uh, and that's actually what we see going on in the media UI um, uh, package that uh, Sebastian is building right now. And I had a chance to help him with a few things there as well. So like when I saw that code, uh, I, I was really kind of amazed by how much simpler it was to get into compared with Neos UI. Um, here you see like a way you just use query. You, you have some uh, GraphQL query here in asset collections and you just use it in your components. And when you want to uh, update a certain, uh, when you do a mutation to update, update uh, a certain component, uh, it just works. Uh, without any manual work. Uh, but if you are creating new entities, you need to write a cache update function, which like the API for doing that is not superb, I would say. It's a bit low level. Um, but yeah, uh, it does the job done anyways. Um, so I guess that's that's like all I want to share with you today. I hope you found it uh, insightful. Let's just quickly uh, recap on the problems which uh, which I have discussed today. So basically, the most important takeaway I would say is that not all states are created equal. Uh, so find the right tool for the job. Uh, probably you don't want to be managing all your state in your app with one single tool. Um, don't try to pick 
advanced, complicated, low-level tools if you're doing something common. Uh, in such cases, it's much. It would be much, much more efficient to choose a common tool like a Polar Client or a Redux, a React query um, to solve that problem. And uh, if you are doing like advanced crazy stuff, you probably know what you're doing anyways without this talk. Um, and um, in that case, try a factor <laughs> if you're doing crazy things and share your findings. Uh, that would be <laughs> very interesting to see how uh, your advanced people find this library. Um, and every abstraction has a cost to pay. So if you're picking some high-level math-based uh, abstraction like RxJS or Factor, then you would pay for it uh, by having to teach all the developers on your team and by making sure they write the right kind of code. So uh, in some cases, it would pay off. In some cases, it wouldn't. Like I know a lot of projects that failed and that had ridiculous kind of bugs just because people were not understanding what they were doing uh, using some really complicated solutions where uh, a simple use state would have sufficed, I'd say. So choose simple abstractions for simple problems and advanced ones for the advanced problems. And uh, don't be dogmatic, uh, don't care too much like about what other people uh, think uh, and say like, uh, for example, if you have experience using Redux and you are efficient at it and you have developers trained to use Redux, uh, do use it, keep on using it. Don't listen to people who say that Redux is dead. So uh, don't be afraid to experiment, uh, don't be afraid to fail. Um, and share your findings. Um, so follow me on Twitter. Um, I write uh, some, I try to share my experience uh, as a software developer uh, there. And uh, I would love to uh, listen to what you have to say. Um, yeah, and that's, I guess I survived preparing yet another <laughs> online uh, pre recorded talk. Um, Hope it's going to be the last one <laughs> for me. And the next time I'd see you all uh, live in person and have a chance to drink a cup of tea with you. <laughs> um, so see you. See you next time live. Bye. Speaking of live, thank you very much, Dimitri, for this awesome well, it was a deep, I would say deep dive. It wasn't an introduction. It was a deep dive into uh, the current state of React, no pun intended. <laughs> um, Dimitri is live with us uh, in the video. And um, for those of you who joined the stream for the first time, uh, we after the talks, which are pre-recorded, we... Uh, we have the chance to talk to the speakers live. Um, so here is Dimitri. Hi, Dimitri. Hey, hey, everyone. It's it's so great uh, that you have the chance to to talk to us. Um, you just said in our preparations already that you're in your dacha again, uh, watching Neos conference, and uh, your kids are there with you. The, the picture you showed uh, with with the twins <laughs> yeah that's the that's the picture i have in mind when i think about the last 12 months you know right. home office and on the other side of the camera there is mostly chaos uh, especially with for those who have kids uh thank you very much for for the time you took to record this this talk um with everything you just showed us about react um, when you think about the neos backend uh, are there specific areas where you say uh with what you've learned, you would redo those areas? And is that something that if people wanted to, they should get in touch with you to, to plan that? Yeah, that's a very good question. I've, I've been thinking about it ever since uh, Sebastian has shown, has shown me his uh, work on the media UI. And I, I was just totally amazed how much simpler things are uh, compared to how we did them in the Neos UI, 
Uh, and if we could use, uh, for example, Apollo client for managing all the caching of server state and all the interactions with it. Um, but then, like when I thought about it a bit more, probably it, it wouldn't be as easy as in Media UI. Probably it wouldn't be just as simple as just taking Apollo client uh, because we have an iframe in the main UI and you have multiple ways to fetch data uh, either through. Ajax requests, or when they are rendered as script tags inside the pages when you browse them through an iframe. And it's all really like a lot of custom stuff going on. So like it wouldn't be possible to just drop in uh, a replacement of what we have now with an Apollo. But if I was doing it now, I would uh, definitely think more about separating the uh, backend state logic, like how we cache backend state from the actual UI interactions and UI state management. So even if still using or and Redux Saga, which I think is still perfectly fine to use, uh, like I would uh, try to separate different domains of state management better. Uh, okay, that makes sense. Okay. Um, so if someone from the community who's maybe watching the stream right now wanted to get involved in, in those kinds of activities, who's a, where are good touch points? Where should they you know, say, hi, I, I would like to contribute? Well, that's definitely Neo, Neo's Slack uh, or our GitHub repository. Uh, but uh, Slack would be the quickest way. We have a Neo's UI channel in Slack uh, where... Uh, Marcus and uh, Sebastian and Bastian and Christian and other people who are like more active with the UI now than I am. Like I haven't unfortunately been super active lately uh, with the UI work, uh, but I have hope to be getting back to it, uh, especially once we have live sprints. That would definitely help <laughs> uh, with the motivation. Um, so if, by all means, get in touch. I think there are like a lot of things which can be improved. Um, so either with Media UI or with Neos UI, we have uh, loads and loads of opportunities if you want to get into open source and just try cool technologies and complex problems. Uh, we have plenty of that. So come and say hi. Yeah. Thank you. Robert, do you have an, another technical question for Dimitri? Uh, maybe? Well, I mean, all, all I understood was that Reactive Streams is about people who make lots of promises and then maybe can keep up or not. But, um, well, how, how do you actually decide on uh, which of these frameworks to take, especially in these cases where, you know, you, have, you usually don't have a clean architecture like in the Neos UI where we have transition phases and you have this concept and this and this. So when, when do you make, like, the point it's, it's uh, enough... Uh, to to switch to a new framework. Well, uh, I think the most important thing here is to have a clear picture of the problem that you are solving. Like, for example, if it's about state management, then what kinds of state you have, and should they all be uh, handled by one uni uniform library like Redux or Effector? Which, by the way, I think like uh, all of you watching should definitely check it out. Uh, it's a new thing, but looks very promising if you have one unified thing uh, to, to, to handle it all. Uh, but I think like once you have a clear understanding of what you're doing, like if you're doing something uh, more standard, like standard stuff, uh, then some React query or, or Polar would uh, help you simplify your code by like 10 times uh, without exaggeration. Uh, and which would be silly not to, to take advantage of other people's work. But if you're doing custom, then uh, XState or Redux ecosystem with like Redux or Redux Observable or like Effector, like any of those more complex libraries uh, would help you. And, and uh, I, I think like it doesn't matter so much which library you choose. It's more about how you, how consciously you make this decision and how, how what quality of thought and architecture you have behind it. So uh, don't spend time like internet wars uh, of bashing Redux and, and rather try to think more about the problems which you have. 
um, and not somebody else is having. Yeah. So and so I think the the key point for me I took from this is uh, these these frameworks can help you a lot, make making you write l much less code, but don't use them if you don't understand what they are doing. Right. So you need to understand the concepts as well. So well, Dimitri, yeah. thanks a lot talking to you and and hi to your place. Hope to see you soon. And it would yeah. be really, really cool to, you know, if we could have a sprint in person again next year. That's yeah. something. Oh man. That was so cool seeing Let's you. Let's wish it was it was the last time I did a pre-recorded talk. And Hopefully. I want Hopefully. to see you live and <laughs> give you big hugs. We're sending um, lots of love to Russia. Thank you very much for joining us today, Dimitri. Thank you. Bye-bye.